Can everybody hear me? <coughs> Good evening. Uh, well, it gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome you to the first annual Henry Fenimore Cooper Lecture Series on Early American Literature and History. I'm Carol Malone, the chairman of the board, and it gives me a special pleasure to introduce a lecture series in memory of Henry, who was so loved by so many people here at the library. Henry Cooper was a trustee for many years, and he chaired our board from 1985 to 1992. And before I introduce his niece, Lynn Carey Mehta, uh, two requests. We hope you'll stay with us after the program to enjoy the buffet and a glass of wine. And secondly, just a reminder to everyone to turn off his or her cell phone. Let me introduce Trustee Lynn Carey Mehta. Lynn's association here at the Society Library began all the way back in eighth grade and has continued ever since. In 2002, Lynn joined the Board of Trustees, where she has chaired the nominating committee and served on many others, including the Building and Renovation Committee. Uh, literary accomplishment runs in the genes of the Cooper family. Lynn received her doctorate in Comparative Literature from Columbia University in 2004, and has taught at Columbia, Yale, Vassar, NYU, and Barnard. Both her teaching and previous work at the Ford Foundation have focused on literary and cultural exchange in a post-colonial context. She recently published Poetry and Politics of Decolonization, Tagore Yates, Senghor Cesar and Neruda, and is working on an anthology of literature of the Americas. The library is so grateful to Lynn and to you, her family and her friends, for creating this lecture series in memory of Henry Cooper, because it not only allows us to remember Henry, but it also draws attention to our outstanding holdings in early American literature. So with that, please join me in welcoming Lynn Mehta. scarcely deserve to be welcomed. I will just uh, propel you to Wayne Franklin, who's here to speak to us of James Fenimore Cooper. Uh, couldn't be a more fitting beginning of these lectures in memory of my uncle Henry Cooper. Uh, his daughter Molly is here and other members of the family. And he loved this place. He really was deeply identified with the Society Library. And um, we are also uh, delighted to be able to celebrate our ancestor. James Fenimore Cooper uh, through Wayne Franklin's really splendid biography in two volumes, the second of which has come out this year. Um, my first uh, task, I believe, or honor, shall I say, is to make Wayne an honorary Cooper. He clearly knows more about the family than any of us do. It is a remarkable achievement with wonderful depth of detail and understanding of the time in which Cooper lived. I think I should mention, along with Wayne Franklin, the other honorary Cooper should be Hugh McDougall, who was head of the Cooper Society and done an extraordinary job, too, of unearthing all sorts of detail. Um, but uh, Wayne has um, really uh, brought alive uh, a life and a person who many say has been underappreciated uh, in the last decades. Uh, that happened in part because of Mark Twain's essay, um, which uh, those of us who love Cooper tend to avoid reading the literary offenses <laughs> of James Hunter Cooper. Um, and that essay occupies an interesting historical moment at the very end of the 19th century when American literature was turning away from romanticism and towards realism. So it's really a uh, critical battle rather than a personal battle, I think one might say. But um, reading the uh, biography later years of, uh, last summer, I had the most wonderful time picking out segments to send to members of the family who happened to be traveling in Europe at the time or connected to particular details. They were also vivid. Uh, one cousin, for example, was in France and at the beginning of uh, this volume, Cooper comes to Paris and in the uh, section settling in, I quote, past the arch, the Calèche drove down Avenue de Neuilly between the severed groves of the Champs-Élysées, 
where modest groups of well-dressed pedestrians were strolling. Closing the avenue's vista was a mass of foliage and rising above it with the pointed roofs of different parts of some vast structure, the Tuileries, an old royal palace, begun, and on we go into the history of that place and moment in Paris. The point is that you can walk with, or drive in the Caleche with Cooper down uh, these avenues and through his travels in Europe, and back to Cooperstown to Atsigo Hall, um, where he died, and trace the last chapter, his uh, diseases probably poisoning by mercury, which was a strangely common happening uh, in the 19th century. Uh, Mercury was overused as a medical drug. All these details fit into the whole portrait of a period. So uh, Wayne has succeeded not only in capturing a life, but a whole, whole period in which literary culture was being established in the United States. Um, it's a remarkable achievement, and I want to thank him for it. Um, I scarcely need to give any biographical details. He's a professor, a distinguished professor at Storrs since 2005. In his own way as an academic, he's been almost as productive as Cooper, who wrote uh, 32 novels and a dozen or more nonfiction works. Wayne has written um, or edited about 14, 14 different books, which are remarkable in themselves. And um, he specializes, as you can imagine, in American literature to 1900 with an interesting, uh, additional interest in, in environmental studies. Um, I really am uh, delighted and uh, so pleased that he's taken Cooper as his subject, and uh, we are very happy to welcome him here today. Thank you. spot 
and indeed had given it its name. The novelist's mother was a Fenimore. He had bestowed that name on his Lakeshore farm a decade before he legally took it as part of his own name. And Fenimore Cooper, however appropriate that lovely setting, was for the question Henry tried to answer in 1995, was not merely a local man. This is a picture if you've been to Cooperstown. Unless you've been in a balloon, you haven't seen it this way. But um, it captures the absolutely stunning beauty of the lake and the village there at the foot of it. Seagull um, Lake, 10 miles long, a mile or so wide, beautiful color because of the chemicals that um, exist naturally in it, calcium uh, carbonate, give it a kind of green tint. Uh, absolutely wonderful set. Cooper, Fenmore Cooper, the original one, had not just made a farm there, over on the left, you can see kind of where it was, that bit of green um, above the village. He hadn't just made a farm there. He had created not only that region's, but the nation's first enduring literary myths. <coughs> As the audience listened in 1995 for the sort of pious revelation such questions on such occasions often evoke, Henry told how, when growing up part of the time in his family home in Cooperstown, he and perhaps one or more of his three older siblings, I suspect it was the one nearest his own age, another James Fenimore Cooper, would lie on the floor of the sitting room as their father, Dr. Henry S. Cooper, read from one of their, their famous ancestors' leather stocking tales. Dr. Cooper wanted all his children to know about and appreciate the legacy that came with their name. So, as he read aloud, perhaps from the deer slayer, set on the beautiful lake near which their own summer home stood, the young Fenimore Coopers, as Henry put it, were stretched out on the floor with our heads under the sofa, fast asleep. <laughs> if you knew Henry, you knew his humor. You may have heard that story, actually. Too. Anyone who knew him knows how much, in fact, Henry cared about that lake and its surrounding woods and fields. And part of the caring had to do with a proper adult appreciation for what James Fenimore Cooper had achieved in the books he set in the environment around Cooperstown, but also in many other places, including, indeed, New York City and Westchester, where he also lived. In The Pioneers, uh, written just at the time when John Wesley Jarvis painted this portrait of Cooper, around 1822, Cooper was working on the novel. Henry's ancestor penned what we can fairly call the first American environmental novel, arguably the first such novel, period. Otsiko 2000, an organization that has done much to protect Cooper country, was one means by which its founder, Henry Cooper, sought to carry on that part of the novel's legacy. If he nodded off under the sofa as a boy in his youth, Throughout his long, productive life, he was always alert to the tasks that needed his and our attention. He was moved by a deep affection for the things that mattered to him, which were many and important. And as the indirect beneficiary of that deep affection of Henry Cooper, I want to say just how much his support meant for me as I worked on the biography of the novelist. Near what proved to be the end of his life, I was glad that I was able to let Henry know the second volume he had helped to name it. Indeed, it was finished in the hands of the publisher. I only wish he could be here with us now. He is in spirit. But then, of course, in his actual presence, there would be little need to remember him <laughs> as warmly as I hope we all do while I speak about his famous ancestor. All that said, I suspect that James Fenimore Cooper himself would not approve of my talk here tonight. So here's, here's where the backstory begins. As far as I know, this is not personal with regard to either Henry or myself. The novelist would not favor anyone coming forward to speak about his life publicly, now or in the future. This fact has much to do with how I came to write the biography and why it took so long, not only for me, but <laughs> historically, well past the bicentennial of Cooper's birth in 1989, for anyone to work through his papers and make a story out of their manifold, rich, and complex bits and pieces. Cooper, who published his first 
first book in 1820 was called Precaution. It was anonymous. It was uh, rumored to be, and, and the rumors uh, stem from Cooper himself, by a lady. <laughs> so he, he loved Jane Austen's works and Hannah More's works, read them aloud. His, his, his mother, I think, was one source of Cooper's love of literature. Uh, she was not able to write, we know because of signatures on documents for which she used an X, but she could read. So she had that um, capability that was not uncommon in her time. And she loved to read novels and fiction. Um, so Cooper, who published his first book in 1820, soon emerged, very quickly in fact, as the first internationally famous American novelist. And his achievements came at a time when the new nation was sorely in need of stories for domestic consumption and foreign export about what Americans were or might become. One of the, the stunning things about the background of Cooper is that between 1770 and 1820, when Precaution was published, 50 years, only 100 novels had been written and published by American authors. It's two a year. Uh, in the 1820s, another 100 came out, so that there was a five-fold increase. Cooper wrote 10 of those. Um, never, uh, I think, matched uh, as a record. Six of them were bestsellers. So when I say he, he really had this formative influence, the, the figures and the, the books themselves back that up. He also quickly became famous abroad. Um, and I want to just show you quickly some title pages of 1820s translations of his works. Um, Paris. Brussels. Um, notice, um, Monsieur Cucac, and I can. That's all you needed. You know, he, was a, he was identified with the country and the story. Um, and, and he shaped European understandings of the US and its past and its present and its future. Um, the Prairie, published in 1827, immediately translated into German. Cooper went to Europe. Uh, and we'll see a little bit more about that later. Uh, Lynn already mentioned it, but um, he went in part to arrange for better representation of his works in the publishing worlds of contemporary Europe. This is Cooper, a year before his death, September 1850. He was in New York City, Matthew Brady. Heard he was there, knew that he had a sort of bad experience with another daguerreotypist, but decided he'd go and knock on Cooper's door at the city hotel. Cooper came out in his morning gown, big coat. He was working, probably, on reading proof. Um, and Brady introduced himself and said he'd like to take your image. And Cooper said, where are you doing this, and how soon do you need me? He dressed and went to Brady's studio, where Brady shot uh, probably five or six images. These were thought, and I'll come back to this in a bit, they were thought all to be non-existent. Uh, but I found this one listed uh, on the New York State Historical Association website as a relatively new accession. Um, and they had sort of wrong information about it, dated from 1855 and so forth. So I, I emailed them and said, no, this is this is one of the missing images. But it shows that of kind of the other end of Cooper's life, and I'll come back to very excursion to this in a bit. Cooper has been, was immensely influential, not only at the time, uh, but also in later literary works. Um, and also, given the effects of his work in Hollywood and on television, in the culture at large. And he continues to exert wide influence abroad. But until I got access to his archive and was able to tell some of the stories it prompted, he was the least well-known of any of the new nation's cultural figures. The most important writer, in some ways, not accepting Washington Irving, and yet the least well-known. Why should he frown on my presence here tonight? And I, I don't know if that's frown quite, but it's not. It's the, not, not the John Wesley Jarvis. 
image of Cooper just before he had his first serious bout of illness. Uh, a florid flush. I think he's actually been out mowing hay in that uh, John Leslie Jarvis <coughs> image. And uh, you can see he's got kind of a farmer's uh, tan, uh, wearing a straw hat, uh, protected his brow. When he lay on his deathbed in Cooperstown, some months after Brady took this image, Cooper told his wife Susan and their four daughters and their one son that he did not want the family to authorize a biography or even let anyone see his papers. Not all members of the family fully agreed with that prohibition. In fact, two of Cooper's daughters, Susan and Charlotte, soon went far enough um, as to meet with a would-be biographer, Dr. James Wynn, who asked them to grant access to the papers. They were inclined to do so. But their brother Paul, by then a lawyer in Albany, intervened at that point, and the request was rejected. That eldest daughter, Susan, was herself a writer of some accomplishment, her most important book being an 1850 account of rural Watsigo that anticipated and in some ways, I think, influenced Henry Thoreau. Um, this is a, a, a very nice hand-colored title page of that book from a, um, a special edition published. The book did so well, it went through several printings and then had this special illustrated edition in 1850. Among Susan's other subjects, though, was her father's life and his work. In her sumptuous 1860 book, pages and pictures from the writings of James Fenimore Cooper, Su Susan relied on her own memories to give some sense of the background to each of her father's novels. She also excerpted or adapted passages from his work, especially from his five narratives of the family's European travels. And this is the title page. It doesn't uh, quite convey, first, the size of the book uh, or the binding. It looks like a Bible of a heavily tooled leather in many copies. Um, and, and the scope, uh, beautifully illustrated, hence the pictures, they're Darley's illustrations that were used in a, an, addition, an edition of Cooper's works published at just the same time. But although there were many, this is the interesting thing, although there were many things in the family archive that Susan had access to and also might have used, her lingering regard for her father's feelings and or those for brother Paul prohibited her from borrowing much of anything from, from that archive for pages and pictures. She did have a, an engraved title page, by Seagull Hall, we'll come back to that. It's the, the house Cooper grew up in, for the most part. He was born in Burlington, New Jersey. There was a previous house in Cooperstown, but the, the, his father built this brick mansion, really stunning structure in the later 1790s, and this was the home Cooper remembered. The family lost it in the early 1820s because of debt, um, and Cooper was able to buy it back with his literary earnings in the 1830s. So that, that's a house that had a lot of meaning for Susan. Uh, the same prohibition, though, that kept her from delving into the archive for this pages and pictures applied in the introduction Susan prepared for 15 of her father's novels in the 1870s and 1880s. She, she wrote these long introductions, to some extent interconnected with the material she wrote herself for pages and pictures, but in no case really did she borrow much from the archive. It's true that she published a brief and revealing mem uh, rem reminiscence the novelist had written about an impressive solar eclipse he witnessed as a teenager in 1806. Then, too, Susan prepared two separate reminiscences of her own about the family's experiences in New York and Europe. And she edited and published one excerpt from her father's extensive manuscript journals. But up to the 1920s, the novelist's archive remained essentially closed to the public. I doubt that, as one tradition has it, Susan instructed her kin to place the novelist's letters and journals in her coffin when she herself should die. Too many documents survive for that to have been true or true in any large sense. But the story itself does underscore the sense of protective care and prohibition that her father had evoked in 1850. 
go back to Brady and think about what's going on in Cooper's mind in these last months of his life. It's pretty pale and hearty at this point. We know from what people say who saw him in New York at this time. Brady's own reminiscence just as much. He's eager to have the images made. Comes quickly to Brady's studio, chats with, with Brady while the process is on. The archive was closed in any case, but it was preserved as the family struggled with the double bond that the novelist had in effect created. Even as Cooper's descendants in those first couple generations kept his papers, they added to the collection by securing letters Cooper had sent to other correspondents, especially members of the wider family. Susan was the curator of the whole until she died in 1894, after which point Paul's son, the novelist's namesake and another Albany lawyer took over. James II, as I call him, to distinguish him, was inclined to make wider use of the archive than his aunt had done. Eventually, for instance, he edited a hefty collection of the novelist's correspondence, two volumes, which his alma mater, Yale, published in 1922. Owing to the natural limits of the family archive, these two volumes consisted mostly of incoming letters addressed to Cooper from friends, relatives, and business associates with a scattering of items from his own hand, mostly retained drafts, <coughs> items sent to his immediate family, especially his wife Susan, when he was away from home, as he was for long stretches attending to his literary business in Philadelphia or New York. James II went on to deposit much manuscript material in <coughs> the Yale Library in 1925 hundreds of letters, as well as substantial portions of the manuscripts for some 11 of Cooper's books. James II also allowed various biographers who wanted to tell the novelist's story, but were seriously hobbled by the prohibition on wholesale access to his papers, to make limited use of some of the still privately held items. Even so, before the 1920s and the 1940s, 1930s and 1940s, Cooper's papers still in the family's hands, were pretty much untouched and untouchable. This was the situation until as recently as 1988, when following the death of Henry's first cousin, the next archivist, Paul, or as he was known, Nicky Cooper, the bulk of the novelist's papers, then located in Cooperstown, went to the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts. Over the years, both James II and Nicky had added items that they purchased on the rare book and manuscript market, items extending the scope not only of the novelist's collection, but also of a parallel collection centered on the life and business affairs of the novelist's father, William Cooper, and um, James Fenimore's older brothers. By 1988, this was a rich trove indeed. The novelist's papers went to AAS because that library had long served as the partner of a Clark University scholar, James Franklin Beard, no relation, who in the 1940s was tapped by the Cooper family nearly a century after Fenimore Cooper's deathbed injunction to at last produce the first fully documented and authorized life of the novelist. James Beard had exclusive access to the papers remaining in Nicky Cooper's hands, meaning, of course, that no one else could use them except through him or the family. Yet, when Beard died, himself died in 1989, the year after Nicky Cooper, the family was surprised to find that he had written very little of the promised biography. You can think of a curse connected to the prohibition in some regards. Only two short drafted chapters surfaced when I looked at Beard's papers. I'm intrigued by the fact that this biography, supposedly the focus of Beard's work, for almost 50 years was never finished, or indeed even properly begun. In practical terms, I'm not unhappy by that because I, would, I, I dreaded that maybe there was two thirds of a biography done, and I couldn't imagine trying to get inside Beard's head at the same time I was trying to get inside Cooper's head and finish an unfinished manuscript. So I didn't, I, I, I proceeded and worked with the papers myself. Still, I've often wondered what caused Beard to default on the promise that the, had gained him access to Cooper's paper in the first place. And I think I know the answer. I, I imagine 
that it stemmed from Beard's primary virtue as a scholar. He was a meticulous man who wanted to properly lay the groundwork for his magnum opus. He therefore began his labors by assembling and editing all of Cooper's known letters and journals for a six-volume collection um, that, that was published by Harvard uh, from 1960 to 1968. So he worked on that first from the late 1940s to the late 1960s. Although the family, this was a, a major effort, although the family collection provided the starting point for this effort, Many more items were brought to light by Beard's exhaustive search of public and private collections located virtually around the globe. It's a remarkable <coughs> achievement. Um, and I, I would say when I was working at AAS, I read all the manuscripts they had in Cooper's hand. And I only found one case in which Beard had made a mistake in transcription. And that's because he was using a Xerox from Nicky Cooper's collection. And in the in the original, as I saw because it was in front of me, there was a tear and, and a part of one line was folded over and obscured the previous line. And I was able to very carefully unfold that torn por portion or the folded portion and recover two words. And that was the, the, the whole of what I found, Beard and Nestle. And the reason for it was, was clear. So Beard did this extraordinary job and, and enabled me to take him at his face value as a, as a remarkably useful and, and insightful scholar. Though I did read all of the manuscripts at AAS in the original and then all the ones at Yale as well. With the letters and journals at last done by 1968, Beard next, with his meticulous attention to detail, assembled a team of scholars to undertake a new edition of all of Cooper's written work, which totals some 50 volumes. Cooper was a highly productive and successful author, meaning that he not only wrote a good deal, but also that most of his books went through various revisions and reissues at home and abroad, a process that introduced many at times troubling variants into their text. But for most of us, pick up a book, last of the Mohicans, in a cheap paperback, and you assume that's the book. But in, in point of fact, it's as variable as most things in life. And Beard knew that and wanted to make sure that we understood the process by which the book came to be and also what its meanings were in its various versions. Having a scholarly team carefully edit new versions based on thorough study of all surviving evidence would be of an inestimable value for Beard as well as eventually for the general reader. And this second, even more ambitious project launched by Beard was well underway at the time of his death. It wasn't just a pipe dream. He started. The Cooper edition has suffered two suspensions since then, most recently owing to the bankruptcy of its second publisher, AMS Press. But now, I'm happy to report that owing to a conversation I was able to initiate the State University of New York Press, the original publisher of the series before AMS, has just agreed to resume the edition. The sort of editorial work involved in this, this uh, venture is painstaking and time consuming. Scope and seriousness of what Beard proposed and launched is evident from the fact that to date, from 1980 to 2017, only half of the anticipated Cooper edition volumes have been issued. Half, about 25. I obviously did not, nor could I wait for that venture to be completed? The Cooper family, always supportive of Beard's labors and those of the editors he assembled, was interested most of all, it seemed to me, in bringing the novel's life story to the fore. And so was I. But the family was also somewhat wary after having waited 40 years for Beard's biography to materialize when I first contacted Henry Cooper in the fall of 1992 about my interest in the subject. He therefore stressed that the family did not want to simply replace Beard with any single new scholar. It, it therefore wisely, I think, decided not to give exclusive access to anyone else, even as it reserved the right to screen would-be biographers. Mary Dearborn, whom you may know as most recently the biographer of Hemingway, contemplated taking on Cooper back then, but eventually passed. A pair of young researchers similarly thought about producing a biography about the time I began my work 
but little came of their effort, little has come of their effort. The upshot of these incompletions has been that from 1994 until now, I've pretty much been left alone with Fenimore Cooper as a biographical, though certainly not as a literary subject. Been plenty of work on Cooper, uh, but um, the, without the life story in some coherent form, um, criticism um, sometimes is itself incomplete. And there's a lot of speculation on Cooper's character, his relationship with his father, so forth, much of which is pretty shaky. <coughs> what interested me about Cooper as a subject in the most general sense was the challenge of writing a story about such a prodigious storyteller, some inventive storyteller. Cooper, furthermore, had not had his own story told very well across preceding decades. And there are lives of Cooper from almost the time of his death, um, and I'll mention a couple of these in a minute, uh, up to um, last year. Nick Loris, a British scholar, historian, published the life of Cooper. None of them were based on work with, significant work with primary materials. Also, and Lynn mentioned this, Cooper has come down to the present area with the era with various unflattering and usually inaccurate anecdotes and judgments clinging to him like barnacles. Or in the case of the most famous negative judgment, that of Mark Twain, like a giant octopus. <laughs> Barnacle just, I, think, I like the image of Mark Twain with his hair as an octopus. <laughs> uh, and, and I like Mark Twain's piece on it. It's uproarious. It's also wrong-headed. But, but if you start objecting to it, you realize that he's pulling your leg in good part. He's making you be overly serious. Although the two volumes of my biography do attempt to cover a variety of complicated matters about Cooper and his career, including this issue of his personal and literary reputation, I've tried most of all to, to make the text read well as a human story. The more <coughs> technical information, for instance, particularly in volume two, about the business side of his career, which was very important given his preeminence in the field of American fiction um, and his motives for writing, he was dead broke and so did his family when he started it. All of that is, I try to keep below decks in the footnotes, the cavernous hole of the book of scholarship. Even so, the story proper is a long story, and I must leave it to my readers to judge whether it brings Cooper to life as I wish it to. I'd add two points. First, as long as it is, it was longer. <laughs> Believe me, John Kulka, who was my editor at Yale, knows this well. Um, uh, the second volume, I think it was uh, 1,706 pages when it went into Yale in manuscript. Uh, and I said, look, I realize this is big, but you know, I've cut it already, monstrously. Uh, and when it, when it went back to Yale after three readers had read it, two of whom said, well, it should be two more volumes, not one. And one of whom said, didn't say that. <laughs> but liked it well enough, urged it to be cut in certain ways. I cut 700 pages from it. Those, so the great thing about computers is those, those pages are all preserved, and then they'll go in some repository, so they can be searched if anybody's crazy enough to want to do that. <laughs> Second point, aside from the question of length, is that Cooper's paper, and this, like, this is not about the family, it's about Cooper. And I think his misapprehension of where his reputation stood at the time of his approaching death. If Cooper's papers had been accessible to old, earlier generations of scholars and readers and historians, it would not have been necessary for me to do what I had to do, which was organize the records at the same time that I tried to make a story out of them. Uh, so it's not just a matter of you know, note cards and the story tells itself, it's a matter of understanding what a bill from a, a stereotypist in Philadelphia has to do with correspondence Cooper has with his British publisher. Um, that's not self-evident, so you have to organize that information. And often, for those who read closely, you'll see that I say um, a lot about unlocated letters. I interpret the, the content of letters that Cooper 
that we don't now have from surrounding materials. So there's a lot of inference kind of filling in the lines. I try to do that carefully. So, so I, again, I repeat, I don't say this as a criticism of the family. The family did an excellent job of, of balancing the novel's wishes against its own increasing sense that they owed it to him, as well as to the public, to lift the prohibition from his archive. Say, Nicky Cooper had all of William Cooper's papers microfilmed at Harvard in the 1950s. He had all of James Fenimore Cooper's papers in archival acid-free folders and boxes in a safe place in his house in Cooperstown, basically in a hall, as I understand it. So, so there's incredible care, um, but there's this double bind that the novel has created. I'll return to this point, Cooper's complicity and his reputation a bit later. So aside from keeping to the storyline as much as I could, there were other challenges in this subject. For one thing, Cooper's prohibition had been nibbled at almost from the beginning by a variety of insightful writers outside the family, including his good friend William Cullen Bryant, a poet, who delivered and then published a long memorial address in 1852. <coughs> Bryant had known Cooper for almost 30 years and had often opened the pages of his New York paper, The Evening Post, to Cooper. But neither he nor any other of the writers who tried to tell Cooper's life story from that point, 1850s, to the 1980s could do it in a sort of satisfyingly comprehensive way. If, if only the kids, if all the archive does is um, negate assumptions, its, it's value is immense. So it's not just a matter of finding details and sticking them together into a story, it's just having hypotheses and seeing what counts and doesn't count. When I began my work 25 years ago, 24 years ago, Cooper remained the last major American writer or perhaps cultural figure at large from the period before 1950, 1950 or so, without a thoroughly researched biography. Even the life and career of William Faulkner, who died as recently as 1962, when Cooper had been dead for 111 years and Beard's letters and journals had just begun appearing, was treated by Joseph Blotner in a pair of hefty volumes published in 1974, 12 years after Faulkner died. We may quarrel about the value of biography in general. Happy to have that quarrel. I think it's an important quarrel to have. But in my experience as a reader and teacher, it always has proved useful to know the backstory of a given book and to try to view the world from its author's perspective. Books, I recognize, are, are worlds unto themselves in aesthetic terms and have many roots outside the life and mind and imagination of their authors, but they do not write themselves. They're written by particular people. They are, among other things, the record of particular human actions in particular moments, even as they also bear the imprint of their place in time and culture. I don't do much in the biography, I think, interpreting Cooper's books, except in trying to figure out where the ideas came from, what he was reading, what he was encountering in his experience. Um, from the outset, I was curious to know more about why Cooper was a man who, uh, with a decent number of close friends and generally sociable disposition. Why, why would he have issued the order he his family in the summer of 1851, thus delaying for so many decades the appearance of a biography based on the papers. And I was curious, as already in indicated, about how his family and descendants had dealt with the consequences of that or in greater depth. So I, I read James uh, Fenimore Cooper the second the letters in the Boston Public Library to uh, Mary Elizabeth Phillips, who was writing a biography of in 1913, completely unauthorized, but she she knew about James, prominent Albany attorney, and she wrote him, and, and he, he he behaved as you'd expect he'd behave, as somebody who wanted to help and make sure the story that Phillips told it was as accurate as possible, but wouldn't let her have access to paper. So what he did was he read her manuscript and then uh, provided uh, responses to various issues based on his understanding of the archive. Very interesting.
So he, he couldn't open the archive, but he didn't want false story searches. When Phillips later pressed James II to let her name him as the owner of various items to which he referred in his private comments on her book, comments for which she was able to incorporate some of the information at two removes in her biography, James II nonetheless decided not to allow her to name him. He explained, I do not want to be pestered by outsiders for access to my family papers. That's not the whole of it, I think. That explains the surface motive but he didn't really want to get into, I think, too much the dynamics of having this double bind uh, dating from 1851. Even so, press reviews of Phillips' book on its appearance in 1913 in many cases assumed and asserted that James Fenimore Cooper II had helped her on behalf of the family, a point that troubled Cooper anew. Here was the double bind in actual operation. I think it might have been his reflection on this his dealings with uh, Mary Elizabeth Phillips, it gradually led him to publish the correspondence, to actually put out part of the, the archive. Now, since most of what he had was incoming correspondence, it, it wasn't as, um, as revealing of James Henry Cooper I's interstates and attitudes. Still important and lively collection. Uh, James Fenimore II also wrote on Cooperstown local topics, legends and traditions of the Northern County. He was one of the other in the long line of Cooper family writers. Uh, in, in that book, he included uh, one of Susan Fenimore Cooper's reminiscences. He had, in fact, asked her to write it. Uh, James II also published from the archive a novel of own. This is striking. 1840s reminiscences about growing up in the family home on Seagull Hall um, and, and uh, what it meant to him, particularly in the context of his beloved older sister's death in the fall from a horse in 1800. And yet, James II spurred to open the doors of the vault this far. Looking back in 1933, uh, five years before his own death, on the correspondence, on that two volume thing Yale had published issued a more um, cautionary statement. He confessed that he had, he had had qualms about letting the public see it, even, even this mostly incoming correspondence. The novelist himself, if you look through his earlier writings, letters, as we now have access to them, uh, he was not as guarded about his life story. Uh, he was a very active contributor of letters to the press. He could stand forth in his own voice. And during his early career, he had actually assisted the authors of some brief sketches of his life that had appeared in both the US and Britain uh, to get the story right. He contributed material for it. In several instances, he, he'd also written about the ex his own experience uh, more extensively, most notably in the series of five illuminating travel books that Susan grew on for pages and pictures. Cooper was no Emily Dickinson or J.D. Salinger or Thomas Pynchon in this regard, as well as in others. He wasn't a sort of private writer, very public. I'm never afraid of being so public, though it had its costs. And, and the costs were these. Starting in the later 1830s, Cooper had gone through some particularly bitter fights with American newspaper editors and publishers that made him wary of what the press might do finally with his life once he could not, as had become his habit, correct errors or more, more positively fight back through various published answers, some in Lincoln and Bryant's newspaper, or indeed in a series of libel suits, very well publicized, uh, that he mostly won, beating the editors for their libel suits. He, he, at the end of his life, was especially concerned that fresh attacks on him once he was dead might injure or embitter his wife and children. He did not burn his papers or tell his family to do so, one notes, and they decidedly did not do it on their own. I find no trace in Cooper's case of the contortions through which Henry James and after Henry James's death in 1916, the members of his family sought to manage James's uh, reputation. But as Cooper was facing death, I think he craved a kind of companionable silence that he had not known in the 1830s and 
the fights that produced that feeling, that desire, um, had arisen during Cooper's time abroad and matured after his own time. So a little bit of the background, the chronology of that. Having written his initial six books in New York and its environments, I mean New York City and its environments, between 1820 and 1826, Cooper had taken his family uh, to France. They lived mostly in Paris, although they made long visits to England, Switzerland, and at last Italy. During the more than seven years of his absence from the US, Cooper himself continued to write fiction at about the same pace as before, so that by the time the family returned to New York in 1833, seven and a half years of absence, he had published another seven novels. He always was a, um, sometimes that's, that, that's a record he even beat, as we'll see in the last years of his life. Some of those books that he published, wrote and published abroad, continued to explore topics akin to the topics first broached in his first half dozen books, most particularly The Prairie of 1827, so the German translation. The first book Cooper finished in France and had printed in English there, continued and for the time being brought to an end, the saga of Cooper's unlettered but eloquent and morally upright woodsman Natty Bumpo, which was begun in the fine years in 1823 and expanded on in the last of the Mohicans, his most famous book, three years later. As the first time of broad lengthened, however, um, he, he began to delve into topics that were increasingly remote from the American forest or the open sea, the primary sites of his own early experience and all his early books. Politics was the most pressing of these new topics. Political life had always been of interest to Cooper. In fact, he had managed DeWitt Clinton's New York gubernatorial campaign in Westchester County in 1820. Clinton didn't carry the county, but he didn't lose by much. And it was the, the home county with his opponent, Tompkins, Daniel Tompkins. And since that uh, sort of baptism in electoral politics, uh, Cooper had seen political issues move ever more closely to the center of his attention. Going to Europe hardly lessened the appeal of the topic. A series of hopeful leftward moves in France, Belgium, Germany, and Poland in the early 1830s made Cooper think that Europe, still laboring under the debilitating effects of the Napoleonic Wars, might shed its old habits and give ordinary citizens a larger, newer say in political affairs, much as he thought the United States already did. But when all those leftward moves were suppressed by reactionary forces in country after country, Cooper began to reflect more deeply on his faith in the inevitable success of Republican institutions. He even began to feel that the failures in Europe might presage a retreat from American ideals back home as well. When his increasingly vocal critiques of Britain, of the Bourbon dynasty in France, even the evident inequalities in supposedly liberal Switzerland, brought counterattacks on Cooper from Americans abroad who were sympathetic to more authoritarian models of governance. And then back at home, that retreat from American principles seemed already to be underway. Cooper therefore reached the conclusion that he no longer wished to write fiction for a nation that was abandoning its revolutionary legacy, which was very important. His homecoming late in 1833, therefore, was a pretty sour experience. He returned to New York City in November of, eight, of that year, not as a celebrated American writer eager to produce new books for his American readers, but rather with a man, as a man without a calling, if not quite without a country. Here began his first period of self-imposed silence. He made it official in his 1834 manifesto a letter to his country. Um, there's the cover, and then buried. Talk about burying the lead. This is on like page 102 of 112 page thing he says. It is under this conviction that I lay aside the pen. Uh, and, and he meant he was not going to publish anything for his American readers ever again. I don't want to enter into here the complex details about how his own disillusionment intensified the reaction against him within the newly formed and named Whig Party, which Cooper saw as the natural home of the new political forces he so deeply distrusted. 
He had grown up in the conservative Federalist household of his father, but by the early 1820s had moved leftward to become a Jeffersonian and then a Jacksonian, following the lead of his patron, DeWitt Clinton. Most of the newspaper owners and editors with whom he tangled from 1834 on had abandoned Clintonian politics, which they had shared with Cooper, and now targeted him for his closeness to Andrew Jackson. This was especially true of Cooper's very close early friend, William Leet Stone, of the New York Commercial Advertiser, who had wholeheartedly warmly supported Cooper in the 1820s, but by the 1840s had become his vocal, uh, bitter opponent. Cooper had stayed overseas long enough, I think, for his own interests to sharpen and deepen and shift, but also for the country and those left behind there to fundamentally shift their own positions and values too. This is why the, the homecoming, in stark contrast to the warm, affectionate leave-taking Cooper had experienced in 1826 with a huge public dinner, um, people seeing him off uh, on, the, on the ship that took him and his family up to England and then on to France. Very, very different experience on his homecoming. In the 1830s, Cooper managed to repurchase and restore his father's now ruinous mansion in Cooperstown, which had been sold at a sheriff's sale in 1821 at the nadir of the Cooper family's economic collapse of the topic I cover in volume one. Uh, thereafter, Otsego Hall, as pictured in Susan's tribute to her father, provided Cooper's wife, widow. Um, she died very shortly after him. He died in September 51. She, at the very start, but then the children, their first permanent home. But the nation, whose story Cooper had told in so many popular tales, um, a fair number of them connected to Otsego and Cooperstown, the nation was not so easily reclaimed. Cooper, nonetheless, could not remain silent for long. He brought one unfinished book, an Antarctic allegory called The Monikins, home with him from France and finished it in 1835, then issued his travel books, sort of skirting the question of whether he was writing novels again. An allegory about the Antarctic um, didn't count, as he thought. And besides, it predated his, his I'm not going to write again. <laughs> and the travel books were written in the first person, so they weren't really fiction either. By 1838, he was, however, once again writing novels in earnest. For whatever his opinions of the country's current political state or the press, Cooper had his beam on the printed page. He, he always had it since 1820. When the second of his newest novels in 1838 called Home is Found and rich in satire on the contemporary American scene from Manhattan to Cooperstown led to fresh, ever more vicious personal attacks in the press, Cooper took on the local newspapers and then those in Albany in New York City. He eventually sued eight of the publishers for libel, owing to various items they had inserted in their papers, sometimes as supposed reviews of his books, sometimes as commentary disguised as news on him or the libel suits. Of the 16 suits that proceeded through the courts to a final verdict, Cooper lost only one. He argued several, several on his own, too, as his own attorney. He, he had a Nephew was an attorney, his son Paul became an attorney. But he, Cooper himself, in the courtroom, stood up and argued the case is brilliant. Most famously, he did that when he entered into arbitration over a suit stemming from William Leet Stone's four part attack on Cooper's history of the Navy of the United States in 1839, another of Cooper's publications. I want to say something in particular about this contest with Stone as it offers illuminating insight into Cooper's character and talents and his reputation. First, some background. So, so the key episode singled out, and this is a, the first big history of the US Navy, the first real history of the US Navy. Cooper had been in the Navy. He had many friends in the Navy still, so he wanted to tell the story and tell it as well as he could. But the fights with the press concerned one tiny episode in this history that covered from the colonial period up to the end of the War of 1812. The key episode singled out in Stone's pieces was the 1813 Battle of Lake Erie, 
of Thomas Birch's 1814 view of that now at the Philadelphia Academy of Art. Uh, this engagement, however important for the war, had long been a focus of intense bickering between the champions of his nominal hero, hero Oliver Hazard Perry, and his second in command, Jesse Duncan Elliott. That the supporters of the now dead Perry were all Whigs, but Elliott was a famous Democrat and Jacksonian, will suggest how one kind of fight was laid over others in this very partisan period. Sounds a little familiar. <laughs> Too familiar. Cooper had at first favored Perry, as most naval officers did. But having reviewed all the evidence he could find, he decided that Elliott deserved more credit than he usually had been accorded. That rather mild conclusion, and he understates it in the history, brought down on Cooper the fury of another old friend, Oliver Perry's brother Matthew, who sent out word that Cooper was to be attacked mercilessly for daring to disagree with what Cooper rightly came to view as the Perry faction. Four part review in Stone's commercial advertiser in June 1839 was written by the then president of what is now Columbia University, William A. Dewar, with some matter by Stone himself added at the outset. Dewar, who had family ties to the Perrys, was now not known for his dispassion as a scholar or a person, or indeed for his honesty. I say that aware that there are Columbia grads in the room, but this is his own problem, not the school's so. And I'll give you an instance of why I think poorly. I think, I think uh, Dewar was a, a poor human being. Um, like Cooper, Dewar had been in the Navy as a young man, but he had been ejected after he stabbed a shipmate and then attacked and threatened to kill his lieutenant who intervened. Only the fact that Dewar's mother was very highly connected prevented the court-martial and imprisonment that otherwise would have been his fate. Very <coughs> constructive story. And then he later shows up as a newspaper and uh, educator. In 1839, William A. Dewar ferociously attacked Cooper, whom he described as being, quote, utterly regardless of justice and propriety as a man. This is literary reviewing in 1839. He went on to accuse Cooper of having lied bold-facedly in his attempt to make Jesse Elliott seemed like the true hero of the Battle of Lake Erie, which Cooper never intended to do and didn't do. Uh, Dewar added that the history of the Navy, quote, was partial and deceptive in its overall nar narrative of that battle. In a long published reasoned answer to Dewar and his other opponents on the Lake Erie business, Cooper clinically demonstrated, demonstrated that it was Dewar who lied by, for instance, falsifying evidence silently alighting parts of Cooper's prose and other men's statements so as to invert their actual meaning and give the appearance of truth to Dewar's own warped views. So, so he left parts of Cooper's prose out without using ellipses, and the parts he left out were the parts that ran entirely counter to Dewar's interpretations of the passages or the events. So it's very striking. I recognize that all sides in such contests may play foul. And I have no wish to support Cooper simply because he happens to be the subject of my biography. But it's clear that Dewar lied repeatedly and that Cooper was blameless of all the charges Dewar preferred. No question. For the arbitration with Stone, so you couldn't sue Dewar because Dewar was the author, you could sue the publisher, Stone. Stone was also indicated he wrote part of the first for the arbitration that was meant to end the particular fight, Cooper decided that he would take an active part as he had in some of the court trials. The sessions took place in the U.S. courtroom in New York City's old city hall <coughs> during a week in mid-May 1842. Cooper spoke for two hours on Monday afternoon, then sat and listened as his own lawyers addressed the panel of three arbitrators that day and the next. Once Stone's lawyer completed a five-hour presentation on Thursday, Cooper resumed the floor to begin his closing argument. That session having adjourned at 10 p.m. These are incredibly 
long court sessions. Um, sometimes the jury goes out in the court trials uh, at you know, 10 a.m. And, and doesn't come in until 6, and then they're sent back out again, never having had lunch, let alone dinner, and they report back in at 10 p.m. So these are immensely uh, uh, long, intense, uh, and, in, and in case I'm about to describe, riveting events, public events. Of course, there's no TV, there's theater. Uh, and this is the, the real thing. People could go, there were public sessions. That session, having adjourned at 10 p.m. on Thursday, Cooper returned on Friday afternoon to deliver the rest of his very long address. <coughs> you see, he reports on it to Susan. This is a case where he's writing well away from home. The public audience for this arbitration grew across the week as word of mouth and newspaper reportage drew attention to the high drama of the event. In particular, Cooper's notable performance on Thursday night attracted a huge crowd on Friday. On the earlier occasion, Cooper wrote Susan from the city, many of William A. Dewar's friends came to watch what they probably expected would be the penultimate moment in Cooper's public humiliation. They were instead in for a profound disappointment. As Cooper went on for his wife, quote, 20 of my most active enemies. I don't think I could list 20 <laughs> of my most active enemies, perhaps. But uh, that gives you a sense of the scale of this fight. Uh, Twenty of my most active enemies were there. One in particular, the Whig lawyer and politician Ambrose L. Jordan, merited special attention from Cooper. In 1815, so almost 30 years earlier, 28 years earlier, after Jordan had publicly mocked Cooper's recently dead father, Cooper had chased him with a horse whip through the streets of Cooperstown. <laughs> Jordan said he knocked Cooper down by hitting him on the head. I'm not sure that that's true. But it was a fight. It was a, a real fight in the street. Street fight, as it was called. Cooper had cooled down since then, preferring to use the law to deal with such opponents. Jordan had not. In 1845, three years after this event in City Hall, in fact, Jordan would have a fist fight in open court with the state's attorney general, <laughs> which he was to become later, yet, yeah, Jordan. After which, the sitting judge threw both lawyers into solitary confinement <laughs> for 24 hours. <laughs> Colorful times. Cooper may have expected some similar fracas on the present occasion. He continued for his wife. Jordan took a seat directly opposite to me, and for three hours, as Attorney Marshall Bidwell closed Stone's case, Jordan's, quote, eyes were riveted on Bidwell. When Bidwell sat down and Cooper arose, Jordan was within six feet of the novelist. For half an hour, Cooper continued for his wife, I could see that his eyes were fastened on my countenance. The hatred must have been palpable. No doubt Jordan hoped to derail Cooper by the implicit threat of his scrutiny. But this was to be Cooper's moment of triumph, not Jordan's or Dewar's or Stone's, as he delivered a spellbinding narrative of the whole extensive battle of Lake Erie, managing it with diagrams and uh, doing it in such a way that everybody understood where the ships were who captained which, and what were the outcomes of the various different engagements. Jordan's stare broke. Then, Cooper continues, his head dropped, and for an hour it was concealed. <laughs> <coughs> then, he could stand it no longer, got up, and went out. He was soon followed by Stone, Dewar, and all that set. When Cooper resumed the next day, that was Thursday, when Cooper resumed the next day, the throng of people packed into the courtroom hung on his every word. I now spoke six hours with minimal notes, Cooper reported, and all that time the most profound silence prevailed. I do not believe a soul left the room. When I closed, there was a burst of applause that the constable's silence and a hundred persons crowded around me, two-thirds of whom were strangers. 
The young writer and critic Henry T. Tuckerman was among that throng. He knew Cooper slightly socially beforehand and liked him as a person. But he also had been negatively influenced by the virulent press attacks on Cooper and the rumors about his character, which they had sent floating through the country. Now he was astounded by Cooper's remarkable self-indicating performance. Here's Tucker. We could not but admire the self-possession, coolness, and vigor with which the author played the lawyer, almost alone in his opinion on Elliot and Perry. He stood collected, dignified, uncompromising, examined witnesses, quoted authorities, argued nautical and naval precedents with a force and facility which would have done credit to an experienced barrister. When he described a battle and illustrated his views by diagrams, it was like a chapter in one of his own sea tales. So minute, graphic, and spirited was the picture he drew. drew. He quoted Cooper's naval history as if it were William Blackstone on the common law. He indulged in reminiscences. He made digressions and told anecdotes. He spoke of the maneuvers of the vessels, of the shifting of the wind, of the course of the fight, like one whose life had been passed on the quarter deck. Not surprisingly, Cooper won the arbitration, and that despite the fact that the three arbiters were all Whigs. Even the man Cooper himself had named and another he and Stone had named together. Um, I think this sweet victory um, satisfied Cooper at the time, but it, I think he missed the effect that this public event and uh, people's reaction to it and his own renewed creative activity in the 1840s. He wrote 17 novels in the 1840s, 10 in his last six years. Incredibly active. He's the only American novelist who, writing in the 1820s, was still writing in the 30s and 40s. Um, he, he won people back to him, but he didn't recognize it. And I think as he was nearing death, he feared that more attacks would follow. Instead, I think there's good reason to believe that better treatment would be his. Uh, the first sign of that is, is the event that took place uh, when Cooper, here's a, um, a Brady daguerreotype, not the one I showed you earlier, but one nonetheless, uh, painted by Charles Loring Elliott in 1860. Cooper was coming back to life in this period in the public mind. This was painted as a frontispiece for a collection of Cooper's novels. Uh, and a big event took place, planned by the literary elite of New York City, to honor Cooper. 40, this is not the event itself, but it's the venue, Tripler Hall or Metropolitan Hall, a very short, live public building in the city of Burned in 1853. 4,500 people came out mm -hmm. to hear the likes of Daniel Webster and Washington Irving um, sing Cooper's praises. That's where William Cullen Bryant delivered his oration on Cooper's experience. And, and Bryant, who knew about the libel suits, he was a newspaper editor. He often allowed Cooper to publish in the Evening Post the, his answers to the other editors, the Whig editors. Uh, Bryant was a Jacksonian. Uh, he knew about the libel suits. He mentioned them, but he, he did justice to Cooper in them, rather in the way that we've seen um, Tucker comment on them. Uh, so that event was an important event. Um, it, it led to this book, a memorial of James Fenimore Cooper, which his publisher at the time, George P. Putnam, uh, issued. This is a nice copy. It's got Susan Fenimore Cooper's inscription, April 30th, 1852, about the time it came out. At Seagull Hall, that, that place she will picture in her, her pages and pictures. This is uh, an engraving based on a Brady daguerreotype that uh, embellishes the front of of the Cooper Memorial. But what the Cooper Memorial additionally did in its um, gathering of people together was already anticipated in a striking piece in the New York Times in its very first issue, September 18th, 1851. Very first issue. It's called then the New York Daily Times, but it's the same paper. 
gives a, an obituary to Cooper, and, and it too mentions the libel suits, but it sees beyond, in a, I think in a way that mirrors Tuckerman's comments. Seeing Cooper as not only a novelist, but a man of strong intellect, clear and quick in his apprehension, fearless in conduct, and gifted with a force of will which would, uh, would have made its mark conspicuous in any calling upon which he might have entered. Um, his genius is one of which America should be proud. Now, you might think, well, the, the two men who started this paper, um, Henry J. Raymond and George Jones, didn't have a, a hand in it, or, or weren't attacked during the libel suits. The paper was found in 1851, the libel suits were over in 1845. But in fact, both men, Raymond and Jones, had worked for publishers, Cooper had sued and beaten. So they well knew from the inside the dynamics of that whole process. And they, in part, founded the New York Times to be a paper that rose above partisanship. And I think their praise of Cooper in this obituary is meant to signal their rise above partisanship. And they're calling for a different level of public discourse. These are some of the men, I don't know if you can read the names, all men, by the way, uh, who attended or sent letters to the Metropolitan Hall event in February of 1852. Daniel Hawthorne, Mushroom Irving, he was there. Uh, William Colton Bryant was there as well. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, uh, Herman Melville, heard of him. William Gilmore Sims, Samuel F. B. Morse, a longtime friend of Cooper's, inventor of the Morse Code and the Telegraph, but of course also a great painter with whom Cooper had spent time in, in Paris and, and also in Rome. The, the one person who strikes me as marking like the New York Times, the shift, potential shift in Cooper's reputation that had Cooper not interest, uh, issued his interdiction for the family might have led to a, a very different fate for Cooper in the 19th century. I think um, Mark Twain, who actually worked in New York printing circles in the early 1850s as a young man probably picked up some of the animus that was still lingering in the print shops in Manhattan. But I think Mark Twain, whatever his motives, would, would not have been led to issue the Fenimore Cooper's literary offenses. The one that strikes me, partly because of his own fate, is Herman Melville. So uh, Melville didn't attend. He, he wrote a letter from Pittsfield. This letter is published in, in the book is a little bit faked because he wrote it in December when he thought that the event was going to take place in December. Um, and it, it misread his handwriting. I'll give you the correct version in a minute. Um, but he wanted to write the letter. He didn't know Cooper personally. He should have. They're both upstate uh, natives. Cooper born in Burlington, New Jersey, but for all intents and purposes, an upstater. Uh, with New York City connections. And more so, personal connections. When Cooper went to school in Albany as a boy, he, he knew Melville's mother, Maria Gansworth, well. He knew her uh, brother, Peter Gansworth. He remained a close friend of Peter Gansworth throughout his life. His last trip to Manhattan in March of 1851. He stops and spends a night in Albany so that he can have dinner with Peter Gansworth and other friends. Um, so they, they should have met, they didn't meet, but what was telling is the way in which Melville acknowledged the, the prescience of Cooper, not only as a, a sea novelist who had cleared the way for his own sea fiction, Cooper also benefited from Melville's early books, but also as a kind of public intellectual, somebody who despite his troubles uh, marked what role somebody like Cooper or maybe Melville on his own conceit um, should have held. Um, so Melville, Melville writes this letter right at the time when Moby Dick is appearing in the fall of 1851, just after Cooper's death. And, and before it's entirely clear that Melville's fate has been sealed by the inability of the reading public to understand Moby Dick. And I want to get you the exact uh, text of what Melville wrote. Um, he was, Melville insisted, 
not the contentious figure the Whig press had once made him out to be, but rather a figure, quote, so very dear, not only to American literature, but to the American nation as well. It always much pained me, Melville went on, that for any reason in his later years, his fame at home should have apparently received a slight temporary cloud. It's, it's, it's being remembered now not as a period of political contention that stretched almost a decade, but rather as a slight temporary clouding from some very paltry accidents, more or less, incident more or less to the general career of letters. He, he did not hold Cooper blameless for those accidents, but he added that whatever failings Cooper had were, quote, the almost infallible indices of pervading greatness. Mm -hmm. uh, Cooper thought something was wrong, he said it. He stood up, he faced his accusers, he faced them down as with Jordan and Stone. Cooper had been blasted by the Whig press as a crank, an aristocrat, a money-grubbing anti-American writer who catered to foreign audiences, and worse. This was not the man Melville found in the books, or no doubt heard about from his mother and uncle. Instead, Melville found something else entirely. Here in the last autumn of his own soon fading fame, the author of the best novel written in the United States prior to Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, paid Cooper his due. He was a great, robust-souled man, all whose merits are not even yet fully appreciated. And that's where you can see the typo uh, are not seen yet fully appreciated. It doesn't make any sense, logically, mm -hmm. in fact. Then, as if turning from the past of Cooper to the future readers, readers of their common country, readers who would not really begin to discover the merits of Moby Dick until the 1920s, Melville added, but a grateful posterity will take the best care of Fenimore Cooper. That has and has not happened. Partly that's because of the sheer bulk and range of what Cooper wrote, 50 volumes. Um, partly because of this unfortunate truth-telling need he had, um, and, and his courage, I think, in standing up to the powerful publishing interests of his time. Um, and, and partly because of the, he, he held forth his own right to write about whatever he thought needed to be said and written about. Um, no writer of Cooper's time, I think, embodied so broad a spectrum of American space and experience, from the wilderness to the sea and beyond. No other writer then or earlier managed to make the creative life economically feasible in the workaday world of the young country. He did that by himself. He worked out the terms. He made publishers willing to pay thousands of dollars for books. They, they hadn't been doing that before. Finally, few writers of Cooper's time or later left such a compelling example of the sorts of public responsibility that the creative writer, creative figure, ought to have in a democracy. Having been born in 1789, the same year as the nation, Cooper took seriously the challenge of imagining the country, even as he grappled with it at times distressing realities. Melville, I think, was right. We owe Cooper a great deal, more in fact, that we have yet, than we have yet managed to repay. So, repay. <laughs> Some of these men walked within 10 miles of the Hudson Bay uh, outpost. 
Also, I have been involved in getting Henry's work into electric book publication, Open Road Media, address electric publisher. The question that I have is, is a speculation, or more than a speculation, is it possible with James Fenimore Cooper's reluctance to have a biography was due to the financial reverses and fiascos that were then reversed of his father, and that of course that he himself took up in the temples of Temple Town, which is a not very thinly disguised autobiographical novel about the Cooper family. And I'm question for you is is this possible? that is one of the main concerns is there not be a biography that would go further into this family history of his father's misfortunes. Is that a possibility? So I, I think my response should be whoops. Would be? Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> because I did it. And it's, I, uh, I took. I haven't read your book, so I don't okay, know. Okay, okay. Well, maybe you won't want to. <laughs> uh, it, it does seem to me significant that we have the records of all of that, including William Cooper's problems, through James Fenimore Cooper's preservation of the, the archive. So when he, when he went to France in 1826, he did not own a home in the United States. He had no place to leave his own papers. Uh, his father's papers were with a lawyer in Cooperstown, William Campbell. Um, some of Cooper's papers he left, I think, with the Delanceys in, in Westchester. Some he left with Campbell himself. He had not been back to Cooperstown in, when he left in 1826. He had not been back in nine years. So it hurt him what had happened to the family. He became a writer because he thought he might make money. He had a friend, a British banker, who moved to New York, Charles Wilkes, the uncle of the explorer of the same name who knew the inside of Walter Scott's story, and knew Scott had made a lot of money. He had banking connections in London, Charles Wilkes. And I think Wilkes knew Cooper could tell stories. Cooper was an anecdotalist. And I think he suggested to Cooper, whose financial plight he understood, that Cooper might just turn a buck by telling a story. And, and I think Cooper did think he could become the American Scott. It's an outrageous notion. If you're um, on the edge of bankruptcy, literature is not the way out, <laughs> ever, right? Uh, and yet, for Cooper, it was. It was. That's what happened. It happened in part because he was very cagey about how he managed his career. I think in the 1840s, after the homecoming and the, the upsets and the struggles with his old friends who were now his enemies, and um, the fact that his earnings were decreasing, one of the reasons he wrote 17 books in the 1840s was his books were earning about half what they did in the 18, late 1820s. He was under incredible pressure to keep afloat. When he died, Otsego Hall was in his family's possession. His wife died six months later. The children had to sell it. It became a girl's school because they could not maintain it. So despite all the money he earned, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars by modern standards, um, he was hard pressed. And I think he felt that very deeply and privately in the 1840s. And you can see in some of the books that the, the um, anxiety about property and the loss of property, very clear if you, if you read the books as autobiographies. And I think the, not only Home is Found, the Templeton story, but his Hudson Valley, his five Hudson Valley novels of the mid-1840s are those, those sorts of books, too. They're very well biographical. So it's possible that Cooper would have been reluctant to have that story shared. On the other hand, he was very proud of having pulled himself out of the hole his family had left him in. He didn't lose the money in the 18-teens. His older brothers did. And it was largely because of debts his father had not managed very well. So the interest accumulated, and with the fall of real estate values after the War of 1812 was over, the family was bankrupt. And, and that Cooper cleaned it up, and then because he had borrowed against his expected inheritance, he had to find some job. He'd been thrown out of Yale, he'd given up the Navy. He was a gentleman without a job, without a career. So he invented one. 
She was very proud of that. Um, I think had he wanted that story not told, he would not have saved the papers. The thing that I, I most prized that Henry did for me was that he, he gave me, in one of our meetings, a microfilm of documents which I think were in his hands. Uh, the microfilm was made by the New York State Historical Association in Cooperstown. Um, but the documents were not there. But they may have been there in the bowl, but they may have been stored there for Henry. James Beard had never seen those documents. It's an interesting story I haven't quite figured out. Um, Alan Taylor, who wrote the, the very good book on William Cooper, and who dealt with Nicky before Nicky's death, he, he went and saw the archive in Cooperstown before it was transferred to, to Worcester, told me that Nicky, and this is why Nicky would have, I think, microfilmed William's papers, Nicky wanted to write a book about William. And I think, I think I'm right that uh, Alan Taylor had been told by Nicky that he thought Henry wanted to do something on James. Not sure about that, but the papers that Henry had microfilmed were almost all about the business side of Cooper's career. Well, some of us kept asking Henry why he wasn't writing a biography. Yes. And we used to have long conversations about that. Uh, do you think he intended to or wanted to? I think you're very honest, as everyone in this room knows. Honest or false. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, right. I don't know. Well, uh, he didn't, of course, have all the documents. He, what he had was a treasure trove of a lot of material about the business side that would have changed James Franklin Beard's annotations to the letters and journals. So, great question, Owen. And uh, Pen Henry was uh, honest with fault, but didn't say, I'm giving you this. Beard never saw it. It became clear to me Beard had never seen those materials. Yes? Yes? Oh, I was just going to say if anybody has maybe one more question. I have a question yeah. about the um, putting aside the pen. And I mean, the suggestion given often about it now is that it's a kind of American propaganda. But he seems to be saying that his Americanism, if you want to do yes. that, is not being accepted in Europe. And so, I mean, the way I read it is that he's saying it's a kind of anti American. Propaganda in Europe. Yeah, uh, I think he, I think he agreed. Yes, he, he agreed, and he became propaganda battles. Uh, yes, he, he became very unpopular in Britain in 1828 because he, like Henry, called things by what he thought they deserved to be called by, um, and particularly New Englanders picked up on that anti-Cooper propaganda and and were suspicious about Cooper when they later met him in Paris or Italy. Um, and Cooper felt that some of the people who were suspicious of him were suspicious of him not because of this anti-Cooper propaganda from Britain, but rather because they secretly sided with the rising authoritarian regimes and interests in Europe. There's a, a guy named Levitt Harris, who was a particularly despicable <laughs> operator. He was John Quincy Adams's assistant, as his uncle, Levitt Harris, had been, uh, at, in St. Petersburg, when, when John Quincy Adams was a minister there. Uh, and he later sued John Quincy Adams, because Adams wouldn't bail him out in a particularly vicious uh, circumstance. Very interesting guy who um, used his position in the American uh, embassy or mission in St. Petersburg to enrich himself. He, he bribed uh, American shipmasters before he cleared their cargoes and so forth. And did all this directly. And then he shows up uh, and becomes the temporary chargé d'affaires in Paris for the US. And Cooper's livid. And he thinks Levitt Harris, who is siding with the Bourbon restorationists in, in France, is a great instance of an anti-American American. That is, he's, he's not a, a small state Democrat. He doesn't believe in the people. He doesn't believe in the Constitution. He believes in self-interest. Um, and, and part of Cooper's withdrawal from authorship is triggered, I think, or part of the motive is uh, triggered by his perception that many Americans abroad 
are Europeanized, too Europeanized for the country's own good. So in this, this um, allegory that he publishes in 1835 when he comes back, um, there are different countries, one called Leap High, one called Leap Low. It, the countries are peopled by monkeys. This is a <laughs> crazy, but bear with me. And he, he has one whom he calls a Leap High Eyes, Leap Low Earth. And what he means is a Europeanized America. Because Leap High is Britain, Leap Low is America in Andy Jackson's brain. And, and this character is based on Levitt Harris. So there are particular people who attack Cooper, begin attacking Cooper, because he's too radically leftist in his politics in, in Europe. And then their partisans in the United States begin echoing the same thing. So I'm, I think there's anti-Cooper propaganda. Um, I, I don't think Cooper's so worried that European countries are behind the wall on a kind of international Republican revolution, but he's worried that Americans may be backsliding by aligning themselves with the reactionary forces in European countries. But, uh, it's a fascinating uh, subject. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming.